a live feed from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, where the presidential candidate uh, for the coming election on August 9, William Ruto, who is also uh, the deputy president, uh, is uh, taking questions uh, from uh, uh, the panelists. Uh, but quite uh, a twist there, because uh, the uh, main challenger, uh, Rilo Dinga, is absent on this particular one. Uh, more than 22 million Kenyans uh, will be voting uh, uh, on August 9 to choose uh, who will be their leader for the next five years. Four men have presented themselves uh, to succeed President Uhuru Kenyatta, as you can see there, uh, is one of them who is the Deputy President, William Ruto. Two of these uh, four men uh, uh, should be telling Kenyans uh, and the rest of the world their plans if elected in a presidential debate ahead of uh, the elections in August. Uh, quite a, a sad one. Uh, we have a one-man debate in Nairobi. But again, let's see what happens uh, today. We're being joined by Alphonse uh, Shiundu, who is a country editor, Kenya at Africa Check. Uh, he joins me, and of course, uh, Demas Kiprono, who is a policy analyst and a human rights lawyer. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Uh, well, Africa waited for this moment, but somehow it, it doesn't look uh, as if, uh, well, it's uh, what... Uh, let me start with the Alphonse. Did you expect what you've seen at the moment? I think you have to unmute your microphone. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, that is expected. In the, um, uh, we expected one person to show up. We expected that person to be the deputy president. And we expected that he would meet very tough questions about his public record and about uh, what he's promising when he gets uh, power in, in, in Kenya, if he gets power in Kenya in, 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 uh, after the elections in 2017. So yes, we, we, that was an expectation. And uh, what he uh, has done is to come, try to explain what his policies are, try to defend his record in public service. And it is very good from the moderators to see them um, uh, put him to task to respond to questions about his performance as deputy president, about his record in public service. Let me bring in Demas here. Demas, thanks for your time and for the patience. We've been following this all day. Uh, what's your reaction to Azimio presidential candidate Raila Odinga and George uh, Wachakoya, uh, who is of the Roots Party, uh, on their decision to withdraw from today's debate. Um, thank you for having me. First of all, um, so this is not the first time um, a presidential candidate has failed to appear uh, for the presidential debate. Uh, last time around, uh, the, the current president uh, also failed to appear. And um, earlier this month, uh, Deputy President uh, William Ruto himself had indicated that he would not participate if certain um, conditionalities were not met. And so um, you find that uh, um, in their calculations, perhaps um, the different uh, uh, presidential aspirants have given uh, the presidential debates um, um, not, not quite uh, um, a very persuasive uh, tool for getting elected. However, um, it is a legitimate, a legitimate expectation by all Kenyans that their presidential candidate would be able to come before them and to um, explain their manifesto, explain their rationale, explain how they are going to take Kenya forward and solve certain problems that are bedeviling uh, the people of Kenya. The, the, there is unprecedented uh, inflation, we have a debt burden, um, there's corruption, and there's so many problems that need um, clear um, articulation on how they're going to be solved. So um, it is sad that we were not able to see that back and forth uh, from um, the people who hope to lead us, uh, but um, um, they perhaps, uh, um, the, the ones who did not show up perhaps had their own calculations. Uh, and Alphonse, uh, take us through a, a little bit of history and, uh, you know, situating it in Kenya. Uh, Demas has just said that this is not the first time 
And if you also look at, uh, look at it uh, also in Nigeria, this is uh, almost a tradition uh, that a ruling party or a sitting president, uh, in the case of President Buhari, uh, will blatantly refuse uh, to be a part of a debate. So uh, what does this tell uh, of our democracy on the continent? So a little bit of the history. In 2017, when, when Kenya started these presidential debates, all the presidential candidates turned up for the debate. There were eight of them, and all eight showed up. In 2013, uh, it ended up being uh, Raila, uh, Raila who was the, one of the front runners in the second tie debate, uh, who only showed up. The, um, the president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, back then in 2017, did not uh, show up for the debate. And it, is, it explains, uh, part of it is that there is a calculus, a political calculus that uh, contenders make when, when they want to, to skip the presidential debate or to attend the presidential debate. They have to ask themselves, if I go and I meet all the tough questions about my record, would I look good or like look bad? And if their answer is that they are going to look bad, then they are not going to show. The other question would be, uh, is there, what's the opportunity cost for me to show up for the debate? Would I give my opponent a platform to shine? Uh, would I, like, if, you, if you're fighting a giant, automatically uh, you, you are the underdog and then there is some kind of um, uh, favorable outlook that you get. So that's the kind of, of thinking that they would do. But in the case of Odinga, he's made it clear that uh, he wouldn't want to debate the deputy president because in his view, he thinks uh, that would... Uh, would uh, make it difficult to prosecute some of the issues uh, relating to governance and integrity, given uh, his perception about Ruto's public record. So those are some of, that is the calculus. What does an opposition leader, former prime minister, who has a record, a historical record of fighting for democracy and liberation in, in Kenya, skipping a presidential debate, a platform, as Demas has said, where people show up to respond to questions, to like it's a it's a platform for accountability. It's a platform. It's an interview where you you're going to tell people, okay, this is this is my plan. This is what I'm going to do, and you also stand up to scrutiny from from the questions by the public. What does that mean to democracy if you if you give the fourth estate? The people who are like the channel uh, where the public can get to you, where the public can ask questions uh, about what what they should expect from your presidency. What what is that is that kind of um, uh, a disrespect to the public? Is that kind of um, something that uh, would weaken democracies? Um, do you get? awards, do you get tokens, do you get political bonuses for not showing up, for not being held accountable? Ultimately, it's only an answer that uh, the answers to these questions are not like clear cut. Because as you know, uh, politics is very, very fluid. In an ideal world, the answers would be very clear where you would say and, it's... And, um, and that's the problem. Let, let, me, let me jump in here because that's the issue now. In an ideal world, I, I'll come back to you, Demas. Just let me as, as, you know, wrap this up with uh, 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 Alphonse. Now, when we say an ideal word, uh, world, uh, it, it looks to, as if uh, the Afghan democratic space uh, isn't ideal. Uh, and that is why... If the electorate is that important, uh, help us here and uh, make sense, uh, Alphonse, then any candidate uh, should present himself or herself before the people and speak to the questions uh, that concerns uh, the electorate in that community. Yes, uh, that, that, would make, uh, in, uh, that would be a very good platform for people to show up, for people to engage, so what, for what candidates to be green. So, yeah? so, so what makes us not ideal? No, no. Uh, they, they are too, so here we have a situation 
where both candidates want to speak to the public. They just don't want to share a platform. So one is saying, I'm going to show up, I'm going to go to the presidential debate, that's where I'm going to prosecute my issues. The other is saying, I'm going to convene a town hall, and you can ask me questions in the town hall where I'm going to respond to questions. So that is the kind, but they don't want to be side by side, and that robs Kenyans to uh, uh, an opportunity to put them side by side and decide uh, which of the two would, would fit. Either uh, when you listen to some of the handlers of, of Odinga and how they speak, it's that they, they, they looked at the whole thing and they wanted uh, a little bit more uh, engagement, and that's why they favored the town hall format. For Ruto, this was a platform where he just wanted to come and face the moderators, face the media, and respond to the questions. So those are the two, but what has been dropped and what we are missing in Kenya is that we do not have an opportunity to have all these contenders side by side. It actually doesn't help that Odinga is a candidate who is supported by the current president who missed out on the 2017 debate and controversially won the elections uh, in 2017, the second election, the first election was nullified. So there is a sense in which um, some intellectuals and some political commentators are coming out to say, wait, uh, what value do the debates add? Mm -hmm. But there is no concrete research, and now I'm speaking on behalf of, or, uh, or on behalf of the community okay. that Let trusts me bring in the yeah. There is no okay. research about the value of, I'm just winding up. There's no research about the value of presidential debate, whether it adds votes All right, or Alphonse, it doesn't uh, add just votes. A, to, just a minute, to... I'll come back to you, Alphonse. Let's quickly bring Demas here. Demas, you, you know, the, the, the conversation now looks to uh, the non-African as if, uh, you know, to say uh, the electorate doesn't really matter in this case. Uh, and it also speaks volume of uh, having what they call inclusive politics. If someone wouldn't want to share the same podium or platform with his opponent, what does this say of uh, those who are watching, especially the followers of these uh, politicians? Well, yes, um, elections are about um, um, institutions and about systems and about a faith that uh, the people ultimately will make the right choice and that you will abide by the choice that the people will make. And so um, um, outsiders would see this as, uh, um, that, as quite weird that uh, uh, persons uh, would uh, give a presidential debate a wide berth for, uh, for example, giving a reason that they would not want to share a platform with uh, their opponent. But I'd just like to remind everyone that um, in 2007, 2000, I mean, in 2007, Raila and Ruto were uh, supporting each other. In 2013, Ruto and Uhuru were supporting each other. And now Raila and, um, and, um, and the president are supporting each other. And before that, or way back in 2002, it was Ruto and the president. So these are people who know each other. They've done dealings together. They have uh, gone through political struggles together. And um, um, I think that they should be able to to come together for for them um, um, for a debate so for the just for the for the principle that Kenyans need to uh, have the opportunity to judge you by well, what you want to do for them. Uh, be that as it may, yes. Um, what is the value of a presidential debate um, in real politics? Does it change minds um, in the world of social media, where um, confirmation bias has put us in um, our various corners and anything we hear, we process through the lens of that bias. We are in echo chambers. Does a debate really change uh, my mind when, uh, when I've already made up my mind? Um, we don't know that yet. But uh, there are so many uh, undecided voters, uh, if you go by the various opinion polls that have been taken in Kenya, have been conducted in Kenya, there are about 20% uh, of people who are undecided. And you would imagine that 
um, everyone would want to take that opportunity to reach those people and perhaps the best opportunity or the best platform would be a presidential debate. Um, so I see that that is a very big challenge uh, that we have in Africa. Uh, that said, that um, I think Kenya is a unique case uh, in Africa because I think we keep making democratic strides. Uh, uh, we have had an unbroken um, um, uh, chain of um, uh, transfer of power, uh, somewhat peaceful. Uh, we've had uh, for the first time a Supreme Court that nullified a presidential election for what it's um, uh, this, it adjudged as being uh, not constitutional in terms of following legal procedure uh, and so on and so forth. And so um, they have raised the bar, the courts have raised the bar in terms of what a free and fair election looks like and what our democracy under our constitution uh, dictates. And so I think uh, Kenya is still in the right direction. Um, and uh, um, I, uh, as, as when everyone, especially the media, civil society, uh, play their part uh, to hold um, our candidates and all politicians to account, uh, we'll continue moving, moving forward. Okay, Alphonse, I bring you back again. Uh, listening to William Ruto and David Mwari, uh, both of, of these uh, gentlemen affirmed to the issues of high cost of living. Uh, tell us, if you will, how best do you think this can be tackled? Because listening to them, uh, some Kenyans are still uh, uh, you know, at sea as to how these candidates will bring them out of such a, a very bad situation. All right. It's not just the two candidates. Let me let, let me just expand the the the, the plan. So everyone uh, in Kenya right now thinks cost of living is a priority or should be a priority for whichever administration comes up. So and I've, uh, we had before when uh, the prices started going up, the prices of fuel and prices of food started going up. The sitting president said it's not a local problem. It's not a domestic problem. And if you read ab um, about what's happening in different areas of the world, then you can see that inflation and the skyrocketing cost of goods and services uh, is affecting different parts of the, of the world. So there is an agreement about what the problem is. The discrepancy or the differences come up in the different solutions that people are, offer are offering. Some some of the of the contenders are looking at it as a supply side problem. Why don't we expand the agricultural land? Why don't we grow more food? Why don't we find a way to uh, bring uh, source this fuel in a different uh, manner? Then there are those who are looking at it as um, a way in which we can just deal with the so, uh, with the solutions by improving the value chains bringing in more from the export market and all that so it's the differences are in how to solve the problem uh, uh, in in Kenya i am unfortunately not an economist with the expertise to know which would be the best approach to to deal with this cost of living but for the, the, for that i would i, I usually often uh, defer to the expert knowledge who say that uh, one of the things you have to do is deal with the inflation uh, in uh, using the tools of the central bank, using the tools of the market, and also figuring out how you can help uh, yeah, the farmers. So Kenya itself, uh, agriculture contributes nearly a quarter of the GDP. So when you think about that, if you fix agriculture, there's a whole lot of things you can do. Uh, from that space. But to fix agriculture, you also have to deal with the taxation regime. You also have to deal with the other governance challenges, things like corruption, which um, bring about uh, illegal or, 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 or an auth unsanctioned taxation uh, that then just pushes the price of things up. So those are, the, uh, are some of the, of, the, of the issues that have to be solved. So cost of goods, cost of services, the high inflation that is affecting things, the high prices, unemployment is one of the big, big, big issues that needs to be fixed. And then we also have um, things to do with how the economy, the debt, national debt is um, 
huge. So that also, it's a place where uh, things have to be fixed. And I'm just glad that the moderators, in asking their questions, they were not just talking about, okay, we have a problem with uh, high cost of price, uh, high cost of goods and services. They were also asking, okay, this, there's a question of food security, which has been promised by this government, by subsequent manifestos. So it's a problem that exists, and they wanted to get clear answers on why it didn't work in 2013, why it didn't work in 2017, and why we are talking about it now. There's a problem of national debt. They wanted to know where is there transparency in the, in the way um, information about the money that we have borrowed is. Is there information about how much Kenya is paying for debt, how in-depth they are? Is, is there information about, because the fiscal space in Kenya has now shrunk, so is there information about how that is going to be dealt with uh, by the next administration, knowing how much we spend, how much revenues we collect, and how much goes to, to debt repayment? And the negotiations, uh, if you heard what uh, Ruto was speaking about, and it appears to be a touchy topic, the renegotiation or the negotiation of, of debt repayment or of some of the tax policies right. with some of the creditors uh, for Kenya. And, and, you know, uh, uh, by the way, quickly, the, uh, thanks, Alphonse, for, uh, you know, taking us through the uh, issue of high cost of living that goes beyond those, uh, these two uh, presidential candidates. Now, you've been able to let uh, Africans know that uh, it's a thing of worry for virtually every Kenyan. So, uh, uh, Dimas, for months now, the Kenyan presidential uh, secession contest uh, has appeared to be a race between two leading candidates, even though we've seen quite a, a number of other uh, candidates, uh, talking about Rilo Dinga and William Ruto. But the entrance of George Wajakoria and David Wahiga has added a new dimension to the presidential race uh, just as we've seen uh, in Nigeria with the entrance of uh, the Labour candidate Peter Obi. So what do you make of this entrance of these uh, two gentlemen in uh, the August 9 election? Um, well, um, I think um, going by the polls, uh, you'd say that Wajakoya's entrance as a person who is a, a fairly uh, a liberal um, um, has introduced the conversation about um, legal, legalization of marijuana, um, um, actually uh, taking advantage of the plant to, to as a cash crop. And uh, his message is resonating amongst the youth uh, who make up a very big uh, chunk of, of Kenya's population. It has resonated uh, with a population that is very um, disenfranchised, and uh, perhaps this has uh, injected something, uh, something um, new into the presidential, uh, um, the presidential race. Uh, more, more so um, because uh, um, perhaps the, the same um, population had been, uh, especially captured uh, by the populist. Um, uh, rhetoric of uh, um, the deputy president, who's one of the leading contenders, and uh, it's, it 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 remains to be seen what the impact will be uh, on the elections. Um, I think um, he brings in very good conversations, uh, for example, about certain laws uh, that we inherited uh, from the colonial masters, and then decided to protect them jealously, uh, such as. Uh, um, laws, uh, laws on, uh, um, on, for example, marijuana, that uh, actually end up punishing the youth, um, um, ensuring that the poorest and the youngest in society languish um, in prisons uh, for very minor or very or things that are considered minor um, infractions. Um, and so, um, from a from a human rights point of view, from a criminal justice point of view, and uh, and uh, uh, being a pro-youth person, I think uh, he brings into the debate uh, very uh, pertinent conversations. Um, as for uh, the, other, the other candidate, uh, um, Boyhiga, um, he, 
um, he is one person who can really claim that he uh, he, he is clean of all um, um, all the 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 baggage that comes with being in public office uh, before, um, and so um, he I suspect that he might um, I mean, um, he might um, get some votes from the uh, the church. Uh, the evangelical or the church uh, going uh, electorate. Mm. Um, so uh, this is what I think uh, is going to happen among uh, these candidates. And they have um, injected uh, very pertinent uh, conversations. Well, uh, you know, mm. Kenya is taking the lead now in 2022 as Nigeria gets ready for the big one in 2023. And uh, some are already saying, like Kenya, like Nigeria, because someone in Nigeria has said, well, it's my lifelong ambition to become president. Now, looking at Kenya, help us here, Alphonse, President Kenyatta is backing Odinga, and at 77. So many see him as a man who probably just wants to serve or achieve his lifelong ambition. Uh, do you feel or think Odinga is the man to take Kenya forward? Well, that's a <laughs> that's a that's a it's it's a question that uh, we take. Um, do I do I think Odinga is the man to take Kenya forward? That's a question I cannot um, competently answer, and this is why um, the kind of work that Odinga has done for Kenya, his history in pushing for liberation. Those who support him think it is time he gets in, he gets in and tries to cement uh, those democratic gains by seeing him uh, as the president. So you would uh, if, when you talk about opposition leaders who have ascended to power, you think about uh, people like uh, Hakainde Ichilema in Zambia just more recently. When he gets to power, will he implement what he's been advocating? all through his life. When you look at, and this is something like, whenever I talk about the Kenyan situation, is you have a president who worked with the deputy president for the better part of six years and got elected with him twice. Yet he has abandoned uh, the deputy president. And now you have a deputy president who is in government pushing against an opposition leader who's backed by the sitting president. So it's sort of a confusing situation and it gives Kenyans a kind of um, hopes and choice. Whichever way you look at it, it's a continuity for the Uhuru Ruto administration. Uh, whether Odinga wins uh, the chairman of the party uh, that Odinga, the coalition party that Odinga is vying on is President Kenyatta. Uh, the chair uh, on the other side, uh, the party leader for is the deputy president Ruto. So the police chances are a good chunk of the policies uh, that have been implemented by Kenyatta Ruto administration will continue in previous administration. So is there hope for the Kenyan voters? Is there, what should they expect uh, with an Odinga presidency or, or Ruto presidency? A lot of it would, we cannot predict, we, it would be fortune telling, we just have to wait and see. And they have given us very clear milestones about what they are gonna do in the first 100 days. That's a short time for people to, to gauge whether they made the right decision or not by picking whichever side they pick. So that's uh, what we need to, 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 to be aware of. But the most important thing, and now I'll speak as, 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 as somebody who, who tries to keep public debate honest, is trying to understand where they are coming from, looking at the kind of promises they make. They might all quote numbers. They might all speak about uh, things that they would like to change. But the viability of these promises has to be assessed uh, against the existing reality. Mm -hmm. If you're promising to improve housing, you're promising to build more roads, if you're promising to build more companies, uh, what under what foundation uh, economic foundation are you hoping to achieve these things? So those are the kind of conversations that um, would inform uh, voters as, as they try to do. The other thing, and probably you might have had this uh, before, is that 
the political mobilization, and this is something a lot of people say uh, is usually ethnic, but this is perhaps the first time that we are seeing conversations around issues. It's not just collecting a motley of uh, tribal kingpins, if we could call it regional uh, political heavyweights and putting them together. It's also a matter of they have done that, but now they have to speak about what they are going to do. And with the numbers of unemployed young people, with the economic straits that the country is facing and the priorities for making people comfortable after the elections, those are things that will define who people will elect and if they would indeed show up to vote. Let me bring in Demas here. And, uh, do you see the possibilities uh, of uh, a runoff uh, in this election? Yeah, so going by the polls, uh, yes. Um, um, I would definitely see uh, the possibility of a runoff. Um, uh, just because uh, the, the, the lead that, uh, according to the last week's polls, the lead that Raila uh, has is uh, within the margin of error. Um, uh, apart from that, um, whatever the result um, um, of the election um, for next week, I am pretty sure that uh, they'll, they will be subjected to an election petition which uh, might also lengthen the period in which we'll, find, we'll, have, we'll have, uh, the next leader sworn in. Um, and uh, we are already seeing patterns uh, from 2017, uh, certain patterns that uh, um, uh, really uh, shock the mind in terms of, you wonder whether they're supposed to inspire um, confidence in the process or, um, raised doubt in the process. And uh, it is these doubts that uh, really uh, resulted in in, the pro in what happened last time, the ratification last time. And we hope that uh, uh, the independent uh, I mean, boundaries of an elections uh, um, body will um, will act, uh, will, will play their mandate properly and ensure that Kenyans get a free, fair, and very verifiable election this time around. And uh, we're closing. I I'd like to hear from Alphonse quickly on the same question. Uh, uh, I know we're not rolling the crystal ball, but do you sense uh, a runoff uh, in this election? It will depend on the on the on the turnout of the uh, the voters. So if they turn out in large numbers, a runoff is unlikely. Uh, if they don't turn up in large numbers then a runoff is likely if, as, as the master said, if you look at some of the most recent poll, that is something that um, uh, pollsters is predicting. Uh, is, there, is there like a likelihood that either of the other two who are not front runners would tilt the election some way? Uh, I do not think so yet that they have the capacity right. to move the election one way or the other. All right, okay. that's a fine place for us to leave it. I'd like to thank you both for being such a nice company, Alphonse Shiundu and Damas Kiprono. Many thanks. And of course, uh, for those watching across Africa, keep in mind uh, they have, that we have uh, quite uh, well uh, a big partnership uh, with Africa Check, uh, which comes uh, on a weekly fact-checking program uh, every Friday at 8.20 p.m. Uh, for the proof powered by Africa Check. Uh, this will actually dissect issues uh, from around the continent to let you know whether the statement, the data, the information, or anything shared is true or false. M. Sliman, many thanks for watching.